Time has a wonderful way of showing us what really matters. Margaret Peters. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hull. And I'm Lee Esses. If you listened to last episode, you were aware that we talked about the recursion, the Groundhog Day, where one character is experiencing the same thing over and over and over again. Amnesia, which is our topic today, is kind of the opposite, where that one character is the only one who doesn't know what's going on in life. This can be used in a multiple of different ways. Let's get in first to what amnesia actually is. I do want to preface, neither of us is a medical professional. So if you are doing this from a medical point of view and not just a convenient storytelling structure, great, but do your research. There's a little bit more going on than just what we're saying. All of our research has come from the internet, so take that with a grain of salt. That being said, Healthline.com does put amnesia into four different categories. The first two are the most interesting to me as a storyteller. But the four different categories make it pretty clear what's going on and how the brain deals with amnesia. So the first category is retrograde amnesia. This is probably the most common one that you'll hear about in storytelling. It's when they lose existing memories, often starting with the most recent. So somebody gets a knock to the head. They won't remember how they got there. They won't remember what happened for the last few days, sometimes months or years. When you're doing that type of story, often it's not the main character, especially if you're doing it in a detective style. Someone walks into the precinct going, I don't have any clue who I am and my idea is lost. And now it's up to the detectives to solve not only who they are, but what happened to them to get them into this state. The second type of amnesia is called interrograde amnesia. This is your inability to form new memories. Often, if you're like blackout drunk, it's not that the tape of memory gets erased, it's that the tape was never recording in the first place. The memories simply don't exist because that part of the brain is like, I'm taking a holiday. It's essentially experiencing trauma. And that's another thing that can cause anterograde amnesia is trauma of some kind. So retrograde is talking about memories that already existed, the tape gets wiped, and Tarot Great is talking about, we can't record new ones. That tape got paused. The third kind of amnesia that we're going to talk about is infantile amnesia. This, I'm pretty sure, affects most people. It just means that you can't remember the first few years of your life. This is not really useful in storytelling, but it's technically one of the four, so we did want to mention it. There's a guess as to why this happens, and... That's mostly because we don't have language in the first few years of our lives. Once we start getting language, then we start forming memories also. Interesting. And then for some of us, you know, that lasts a little longer. I have very few memories of growing up, but I also had a few hits to the head. So I could have also experienced interrograde amnesia. (laughs) The final version is TGA or transient global amnesia. This one is a difficult one to portray, I think. And if you do choose this one, it should be with a medical twist to it. But this is when you have seizure-like episodes of amnesia with repeated actions, often not remembered by the person after the fact. You have moments where you get blackout and your body is just doing a thing repeatedly over and over and over again. And it's described in a seizure-like fashion. It's incredibly rare. Interesting. So in storytelling, amnesia can be used as a way to show self-discovery. Because they are having to maybe remember those memories that they lost. Or figure out what exactly happened when they got super drunk. That self-discovery makes it more of an internal struggle than an external struggle. There isn't a big villain. Sometimes it might be the guy who caused the car crash. Something simple that created the amnesia that then goes and gets arrested and they live happily ever after. But for the most part, the journey is not about conquering the villain. The journey is about finding who they are. Which lends itself to one of the most common genres that it's used in, which is romance. 
in romance, you don't have a lot of big villains, but you do have a focus on the characters in that journey of self. Fifty First Dates falls into this category. Also, While You Were Sleeping, which was a Sandra Bullock rom-com. It's also really good for crime dramas and episodic style stories. You see it a lot in crime dramas where you will have a victim of a crime not remember. So part of the investigation of that episode is helping that character remember what they've forgotten in order to solve the crime. One of my favorite examples of using amnesia in the storytelling process is in Oathbringer, the third book of the Stormlight Archive. From the beginning of the series, you know that one of the main characters, Dalinar, made the choice to have his memories removed of his deceased wife. In the third book, it becomes part of the plot of him recovering all of those lost memories that he had given away. And it eventually leads him to having to make the choice between forgetting and giving up all of that pain or embracing it and accepting it as part of himself. It's a really good use of the self-discovery aspect of amnesia storytelling. One of my favorite types of storytelling amnesia is the I accidentally turned into a monster. Jekyll and Hyde. You also see this with a lot of the werewolf stories of it was a full moon last night and I woke up in my bed covered in scratches and naked. If you're going a little bit more of the urban fantasy, this is the most popular way to approach amnesia. The one thing that you need to remember about an amnesia storyline is that it really isn't realistic. Realistic is not nearly interesting enough most of the time. So it is definitely a plot device, but don't try to portray it as this is how medical science actually works. It can be fun with storytelling, but you have to understand you're not going to make it perfect, but you can make it plausible. There are a lot of known tropes, or I guess subtropes, that go along with this amnesia structure style. If you want to really dive into it, just go to tvtropes.com. We're going to breeze over a couple of our favorites. One of them is that the amnesiacs are innocent. And it's that this new character who can't remember anything about them is childlike and innocent in some way. A lot of fun to play with is the amnesiac costume identity. I woke up in a business suit with a tag that says, I work for Wall Street. So I must work for Wall Street. No, you are actually in a heist and this is your costume, but you realize you have all these funky skills. The costume identity becomes your real one until you figure it out. Then you have the amnesiac liar, which eventually the character forgets that all the lies that they've told are actually lies and they believe that to be the truth. One of my favorites is the forgot the call. Supernatural has a lot of these. The characters forget who they are as heroes and they live mundane everyday lives. And then the final one is the Napoleon delusion, where this character shows up, believes that they are a famous historical figure like Napoleon or Marie Curie. They're basically insane, but they have no memory of who they really are. Now, I know we tell you to avoid flashbacks at all costs. This is the episode we tell you it's okay. Because they have to remember the reality of who they are somehow. And flashbacks is one way to do this. This is also a structure where the solution comes in phases. The internal solution of remembering who they are is separated from the other elements of the plot, like arresting the criminal or getting together with the loved one. We mentioned earlier, dual personalities is a great way to use this. So that werewolf, that Jekyll and Hyde character who's remembering or forgetting only certain parts, these dual personalities of this is reality, no, this is reality, is an interesting way to approach structuring your story and they have to collide at some point if you're going for more 
fantasy, not realistic way of fixing the amnesia. Often the solution of recovering the memories is closely related to how they lost the memories in the first place. This is often with an injury of some kind. So if I got bonked in the head and it rattled loose all of my memories, then a bonk in the other side of the head will put them all back in place. Again, not medical, but fun and interesting enough to tie the solution of understanding the past to how they solved the problem. And the list keeps going. There are many ways that you can use amnesia as a plot device in your structure or as the main plot structure itself. Just remember to be careful. Don't try to make it too medical unless you really do your research into how amnesia actually works. But this can be fun, lighthearted, especially in a fantasy setting where magic is involved because with magic you can do anything. Or in a rom-com where that suspension of disbelief you really don't have to worry about because people would just let anything pass on a Hallmark movie. So long as you're having fun with it. Because this is one that your audience can see right through you for. If you aren't enjoying it, if you aren't feeling the amnesia-ness of the whole plot structure, the audience is just going to go, this is stupid. They won't know why, but if you're not feeling it, they won't be feeling it. So make sure that you write selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 